it's our great pleasure to host the Honorable Andrei Sevchenko, the uh, diplomat, not the footballist. Such a famous thing. You just told my joke. I was about, I was about to, to say that I'm such a fighter now, it is because of my football. <laughs> But the ambassador professionally was not a football player before uh, his uh, diplomatic career. But he started out as a journalist, very well known, one of the founding uh, um, journalists of Piat uh, Kanat, right? Uh, owned by the fellow who has been president of Ukraine since 2014, Petro Poroshenko, and then uh, Ambassador Chevchenko. Shevchenko joined the Rada as a member of Bat Kivshina. The year was 2007, 8, 6. six. Close enough. There were so many elections, so <laughs> one can get confused. Uh, and uh, played a major role, um, some kind of a peacekeeping or broker role uh, during uh, uh, Maidan, and particularly the tragic days. And then, after saying no, I don't know how many times, he was finally convinced, persuaded by the president. Poroshenko to take on the um, duties of ambassador of Ukraine to, uh, to Canada. Um, we wanted to, uh, the ambassador to uh, comment on this very uh, distressful situation already in December, uh, but we ran out of time because of the holiday break, so it's our great pleasure to host him. He will be presenting on the, on the topic for 20 minutes or so, then I will have a few questions for him in the Q&A format, and then we'll open the floor. I'm sure you'll have many questions. And he agreed to go beyond this uh, particular incident and uh, include other burning topics, such as the Tomos. There was a major law that was passed today in the Rada, and obviously the forthcoming elections. So, Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, I would like specifically uh, to thank my friends from the diplomatic community for, for coming here. And as uh, Dominique uh, said, uh, the idea of this meeting came immediately after the Kerch incident happened. And Dominique immediately reached out to us, and we are very grateful for that. But a lot of other things are happening, so I'm well prepared after this to move into other topics, such as church, election, and whatever you feel is interesting. Uh, to, uh, to talk about. I think it's actually good to meet from time to time because there are so many things happening uh, there. And finally, I think it's also good that we actually have a chance to talk about strictly military and security issues. Because I think here in this building, or in these buildings, we talk a lot about the society, about major changes in the Ukrainian society, but of course we cannot neglect the war, the war itself. So, I'll start with walking you through our presentation on the Kerch incident, and then we'll move further. <clears throat> and uh, I actually would like to start with this, uh, with this video, which I think most of you have already seen. Uh, it was filmed by a Russian Navy officer who wanted to capture the moment when his ship would follow waters and ram the Ukrainian tugboat. And if we try to play this video, there is something which strikes me every time when I watch this, and it's the voice, the voice of the Russian captain. To hunt. exactly knew what they were doing at this moment. They enjoyed this opportunity to do whatever they wanted to do without any threat to get a response from the Ukrainian side. Radio exchanges between the Russian officers showed that there were, there were clear order, orders to shoot, ram and capture the Ukrainian vessels. The picture top right 
shows the damage to the operating room of one of the Ukrainian vessels. So they knew exactly where the people were at the boat and they were, and that's exactly where they targeted at. Uh, apparently not everything went well for the Russians. The picture bottom right shows the Russian petrol boat which was damaged because of the collusion with another Russian boat. <laughs> Uh, so it was, it was a well-planned attack, and it was controlled directly by President Putin, as it would be later recognized by his press secretary, Peskov. And it's important for us to understand that this was the situation when, for the first time, Russian military directly attacked Ukrainian military. So this time, they did not hide behind the Green Man, like it was in Crimea, or behind some local rebels, like they pretended in, uh, in Donbass. So it was Russian military officers attacking Ukrainian military officers. The accident was uh, a result of the Russian decision to block the passage through the International Strait of Kerch. As you know, the bridge was illegally built by Russia in the strait. A number of individuals and companies related to this were, by the way, sanctioned by the United States, and I hope that Canada will follow this case. And if you look at the picture, there should be nothing new to you, because this is exactly what Russians uh, did uh, in 2014, when they blocked the passage for Ukrainian ships in the Donoslav Lake, or the Donoslav Gulf, in the western part of, of the Crimea. So at that time, they wanted to, to prevent Ukrainian ships from leaving to, in the direction of Odessa. So the, at that time, Russia stole Crimea from Ukraine, <coughs> and the world did not inter intervene. And this time, they were trying, or they are trying to steal the Sea of Azov. As of today, Russia has dramatically escalated the situation in the region. They started in the spring. The circle zones show the areas where the Russians have started interception and uh, inspection of commercial vessels. Now they have blocked the Strait of Kerch itself. And we feel that they have two goals with this. Firstly, they want to cut off the Ukrainian ports of Mariupol and Berdyansk. Here is Mariupol and Berdyansk. And these ports are key for Ukrainian exports of steel and grain into the international markets. And secondly, this creates a perfect set for further military advance along the Azov Sea coast in this area. We have been talking that Russians, the Russians have always wanted to have this land bridge from, from their territory into Crimea. And I think by now, they are really in a very good position to, to advance in that, in that direction. The blue box at the top shows you the area which is heavily used by them for naval exercises. And uh, this creates clear threat for the city of Mariupol and for our positions along the Sea of Azov. Uh, by today, Russia has deployed major forces in the region, which allows them to effectively control the water and the air in the Azov Sea region. And the, big, the bigger picture tells us that with militarizing Crimea, Russia has greatly increased its presence through the Black Sea region. As you can see, Russia has also stepped up its aviation reconnaissance activities in the region. As you know, by recent time, Canada had its deployments in Romania. And uh, this picture tells us that it was the right decision for Canada to send its, its deployments into Romania. They were making a difference there, and we need strong presence in that region for the future. It's also important to realize that the biggest strategy of Russia is to expand its influence into the Mediterranean and into the Balkans. And Crimea, this red diamond, is really key for that strategy. If you look at the numbers, you see that Russia has been turning Crimea into a huge military base. And our intelligence tells us that we will see much more of that in the next several years. We also learned that Russia has already consolidated impressive nuclear capabilities in Crimea. This includes Navy, aviation, and there are signs that Russia is restoring nuclear storages in Crimea. 
And of course, this can be a horrifying game changer for the whole region. Not just talking about Eastern Europe, but also about the Middle East. So in that sense, again, uh, Russian presence in Moldova and in Georgia is not just to put pressure on the independent nations which want to be closer with the West, but it's also they also need this for the military build-up across the region. So that's why we believe that our Western friends should be very serious about this, and uh, we have asked our allies for several very specific things to do with this situation. First, we need to, we want to get our men back to Ukraine. We're talking about 24 Ukrainian sailors who are, by all international standards, are prisoners of war. And we believe that it's extremely important that Russia treats them as prisoners of war. There is a, there is a so-called Third Geneva Convention, which, uh, which uh, defines all the procedures for such a situation. And this is the document and the legal framework which should be applied in this situation. Well, Russia sees them as, as uh, criminals. They have started court trials. Uh, our sailors are being held in the uh, notoriously famous Le Fortovo prison in Moscow. And uh, from what we know about the Russian judici judiciary, that does not promise anything good to these, to these men. So, uh, they behave in a very uh, heroic way. A couple of days ago, there were first court hearings and all of them, one by one, said that I consider myself a prisoner of war. I demand of you to treat me that way. And uh, I want you to apply the international humanitarian law in my specific case. So by now, there is a, there is a very strong consolidated legal position. And we want all of our international friends to put more pressure on Russia to make sure that these people are treated accordingly and eventually they get, they get home. They were, they were going from one Ukrainian port to another Ukrainian port. They followed all the procedures. They had orders that had, they had to follow. And uh, they deserve respect and uh, deserve appropriate treatment. Uh, and the youngest of them is 19, so many of them are really young. So we're talking about people who, who are now in a very tough situation and they really need help. Second, we. We want Russia to release our vessels. Uh, the vessels were taken to Kerch first, and uh, as of the moment, we do not know exactly where they are, and uh, we need them back. Third, I think all of us, we should work together to restore free passage through the Strait of Kerch. It's an international, uh, it's an international strait. It's uh, crucial for free civil operations in the region, so we need to get international law restored in that area. We do encourage our NATO friends to show more presence in the Black Sea region, and it's very important to make sure again that we can freely operate in the Black Sea and in the Low Sea. And finally, we will, this is the right time for more punishing sanctions on Russia. I think we should, it's a good time to specifically look into the Russian commercial activities in the region. They have made sure that no other countries can freely operate in the region, and I think we, we together we should find some good solutions how we can make uh, Russia uh, pay high price uh, for this. There are Russian ships which uh, illegally uh, go into the Crimean ports and the very smallest thing we can do is to close European ports and other international ports for such vessels. And I think there are some other options uh, to, to go ahead with. Uh, in, the case of, uh, uh, in the case of our cooperation with uh, Canada, uh, is done through NATO deployments in the region and also, of course, through the uh, wonderful and very useful Operation Unifier that many of you, of you know about. By now, more than 10,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been through Canadian training and uh, only God knows how many lives this training saved uh, for Ukrainian soldiers and, and officers. And as we are approaching the date of the renewal of the operation in the fire, we encourage Canada to take the operation to a higher level, more upgraded, uh, uh, to a new level, to a new scale, and to a new depths of our cooperation. Finally, 
we are in, in a very good conversation with Canada on uh, supplying weapons which Ukrainian military needs to defend ourselves. And obviously, this is one of the topics which does not like headlines and uh, public talks. But uh, I can say that we are very grateful to Canada for including Ukraine into the automatic firearm, firearms country control list. This allows us to cooperate with Canadian companies and we, we are sure that this will make us stronger and this will help us to solve uh, the problem in, in our part of, of the world. So I am very happy to report that we are, we are on the same page with Canada on these issues. All the things were, were reflected uh, in these statements by Prime Minister Trudeau and uh, Minister Freeland. And also on the opposition side, this is exactly <coughs> what uh, uh, our friends from the Conservative Party, from the opposition, and from the NDP uh, said they are going to, to support. So again, this reflects this very strong cross-party consensus which we see in Canada on this, on this issue. And uh, I think this whole situation really is taking us into a position when we have to revisit the security situation in the region. I think it's, a, it's the right moment to talk specifically about Crimea. You know that Crimea is not part of the Minsk negotiations, and uh, I think this is another reason why we should bring Crimea back to the negotiation table and talk, talk about this. I think it's, it's a very good moment to discuss how we can better cooperate with our Western partners, and it's also the right time for very practical steps and for very practical actions. So that reflects something that we have been or working on with our Canadian friends in the last uh, couple of weeks. And this is something to kick off our conversation. So I'll have a few questions for the ambassador in a Q&A format. And, um, and then at some point, we will open the floor to this large audience. Um, maybe we could start on the humanitarian front. Of course, you mentioned that, what is the number, 24 um, naval officers that have uh, prisoners of war uh, in Russia. Um, do the Ukrainian authorities have access to, um, to them, consular authorities? Yes, now we do. The uh, most difficult situation was in the very first days when uh, our sailors were detained in Crimea, and that's where our diplomats could not reach, reach to them. So now when, they, when they're in Moscow, in Leporto, that does not make their life easier, but at least we have a good channel of communication with them, and that allows us to provide them with legal aid that they, they, they need. Of course, they're, they're kind of a subset, a very significant one, admittedly, because now it's part of a direct military uh, operation by Russia, but of a much larger population of prisoners of war in Russia. Of course, the most famous is the Crimean filmmaker Oleg Sansov, but there's many more, including a great many Crimean Tatars who were uh, arrested in, in Crimea and then sent to Russia. Can you give us a sense of the scope of the situation? If there would be any progress in terms of a potential so -called exchange of prisoners? Not much. You mentioned Senso and the Crimean Tatars, but actually we are talking about dozens of cases. And uh, we believe that uh, countries like Canada, which has, which has the Magnitsky Act, the Magnitsky Law, should apply all the tools available to put more pressure on specific individuals in, Russian, in Russia responsible for all those illegal crimes. Let's talk about the Crimean Tatars. All those crimes against them, they have specific names. People who made decisions to ban Majlis of the Crimean Tatars. People who are personally responsible for repressions against Crimean Tatar leaders. So I think countries like Canada should apply all the leverage, all the tools that they have specifically to put more pressure on the individuals responsible for, for these, these cases. It's a human rights issue. We know enough about the Russian judiciary and about the Russian law enforcement system. We do not expect any miracles. So we, we should put more pressure on the system. And you mentioned uh, that Ukrainian authorities have access, have had or given access to uh, 
the naval officers in Le Fort Togo. Um, I would assume that since Crimea is an occupied territory, that Ukrainian authorities have no access whatsoever on the specifically on Crimean territory. Am I right? Or precisely. is that precisely? So that's what that's something which was the most challenging thing in the very first days. And once they were brought to Moscow, eventually Ukrainian consuls got access to, to them and now, now they have a lawyer, a very strong lawyer who has made a very solid case defending them. As you well know, it's hard not to know living here in uh, Canada, North America, although it's a global issue, this issue of the wall and the state. I want to ask you about the wall with Trump. I'm just like, making here, kind of put, putting the context, there, there appears to be some kind of fence that uh, has been built separating uh, the Ukrainian main, mainland from Crimea. Is that correct? And can you comment on that? I believe the initiative came from the other side, meaning the occupying power. Mm, nothing that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, what is the situation in terms of, uh, obviously not Ukrainian authorities, but individuals seeking to travel from Ukraine to Crimea or vice versa? Is there still movement or is there kind of a political war, let's say? There are checkpoints and actually there is a lot of movement, movement through the contact line, so through the front line. I actually visited one of the checkpoints with the Canadian minister, Bibo. Uh, last July, we uh, looked how that operated, and actually there is a strong and very important Canadian support to make sure that these check, these check, uh, uh, checkpoints they can operate freely. Uh, but it's not a, it's not a smooth process, and uh, the very checkpoint that we visited in July, every couple of weeks is shut down because some fires and there are bullets flying uh, flying at, at, at that place, and now. With the election coming up, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if uh, Russia made passage through the checkpoints even more difficult, just to make sure that, that uh, uh, to, to make life more difficult for those people who want to cross the contact line and go into the territory controlled by the Ukrainian government and, and exercise their right to vote. If we go back to the attack itself that we saw on video, um, of course, there's been all kinds of speculation that was linked to the election, this and that. But I want to get your personal take or or the, the official take of the Ukrainian, I mean, the government that you represent. In terms of trying to explain the strategy, their understanding of the Russian strategy, of why suddenly putting Crimea on the map so much, because as you said, Crimea is not, even, is not even part of the Minsk uh, negotiations for five years, so all the focus has been on Donbass, understandably so, because there's a live war going on. Uh, but suddenly, uh, since uh, late November, the focus is back on Crimea. Um, I'm wondering if, I mean, it is obviously connected to the larger conflict, and we'll be talking about the religious aspect here, which from a chronology standpoint, I mean, that there is obviously a, these things are happening at the same time. Do you see a connection there, or what could possibly be the strategy? There might be several reasons. You mentioned one of them is the upcoming election. And as of the moment, I don't see a winning strategy for Putin at the presidential election in Ukraine. So I think there is a huge temptation for him to escalate the situation just to see how this might change the course of the, of the campaign. Second, we should realize that Russia has uh, completed, had completed a very impressive military build-up in the region prior to this accident. So half a, year, half a year earlier, it would be much more complicated for them to, to show their force and their presence, presence in such a demonstrative way. Finally, we see this as a clear message, not just to us, but to, to the whole world. They're saying, we are going to do whatever we want to do. And we don't care about international laws, about international regulations. We do not care what you think about this. We are going to exercise what we believe uh, we uh, have to do in this, this situation. So I think it, it can be any of these factors or combination of, of all together. But it's something that something they have been preparing for, uh, preparing to for quite a long time. Did it come as a, timing wise as, as a surprise to Ukrainian authorities or they expected that this was bound to happen? Uh, maybe not specifically in late November, but in, in, the, in the short term. Well, I guess for us, 
any day starting from uh, 2014 uh, is considered to be a day for a possible escalation. So uh, I think there are no surprises in that sense. Uh, but at the same time, I think the the way it was done in this very demonstrative, provocative manner, that was quite impressive. And I want us to bring back to that footage with this captain screaming and yelling and being so excited about this. That tells you something about the atmosphere which has been created on that side. So it's something they wanted to do. And it's something, I think, it looks like they were seeking for a good opportunity to show their force. And uh, I can share, share this situation. When I, was, when I showed this, this video to our friends in Global Affairs Canada, and at some point, one of our friends asked, so where did you get this, this footage? And I said, well, it was all over the media, both international media and Russian media. And the question from the Canadian side was like, but why would the Russians want this, this footage to be shown all over the place? And I said, well, you should understand how the Russian propaganda machine works. Because that's something that Putin wants to show to his people. That they, that they are strong enough to challenge international order, international law. They do not care about anyone in this region. So it's something which actually he would like to be seen by his people. And then someone from the Canadian side said, but it looks like Putin <laughs> <laughs> with this huge, uh, huge vessel, which is four times bigger than this Ukrainian tugboat. Uh, they don't care about this. So they would use in their propaganda machine whatever they have. And they are so creative, so flexible, and so universal in using literally, literally everything. But it really shows you the difference. It's not, a, it's not a conversation about the difference between the Canadian mentality and the Russian mentality. But it shows you how damaging this propaganda machine can be. If we could focus on the economic aspect of specifically the, uh, uh, on the Kerch situation, Initially, there was a, an actual total blockade, uh, which was at least partially lifted. But then, since the, the situation was very much front and center, we, meaning it was reported widely that actually it had been, it had been going on for, for some time, perhaps from the beginning, but certainly since the construction of the bridge, uh, the harassment of, uh, of ships and uh, obstructing their passage, which means that in terms of uh, the economic cost, particularly to the port of Mariupol, uh, has been significant, and, and even more so since November, December. So my question is, if there is to be the continuation of this partial blockade, which from time to time could come to be near total, what are the alternatives, the plan B, that the Ukrainian authorities have uh, for Mariupol in particular, which happens to be the one area on Donbass that is still economically uh, vibrant, obviously. We're talking uh, heavy industry steel with a great deal of export capacity, and, and apparently there's also a great deal of agricultural uh, export. You are going to get yes. back to a map. Uh, which one should I use? I guess this one. Okay. <clears throat> so Mariupol is quite a big city. It's half a million population, half, half a million. and. Uh, uh, the key industry in the city is, is the steel industry. Three major steel plants, and uh, most of the money that, that the city makes is out of steel exports. So the blockade is slowly killing the city. The same goes with agricultural exports, which are very important. So if you don't have this way to, to trade, you would have to find a way to bring your goods all the way to the ports of Odessa, which makes uh, your operations so much more expensive, and that requires time and infrastructure. Uh, we are not prepared for that. Like, so I guess uh, that's a big question for, for us and for the steel producers and for the agriculture products producers in, in, in the region. But it's something which we, we are never prepared for. So they know what they're doing, and they know it's going to damage heavily the economic life in, in the region. And obviously, uh, it's, it's, it's a major challenge. So now we actually, we are, we are trying to find some, some other options, some other ways. But uh, I guess the key question, the key answer to your question is very simple. 
we we cannot allow them actually to to steal the Azov Sea uh, from us and from international operations the way they did it with, with Crimea. There is international law and that law protects civil operations in, in the region, that protects operations through the Strait of Kerch and I think together we should restore the free passage through, through the Strait. On, on the security aspect, the reality, of course, is that the West uh, denounced sanction but did nothing regarding the annexation of Crimea. Um, and with the current American administration, I should say the winds are not exactly blowing. And well, it's a bit complex because lethal weapons were provided to Ukraine, but at the same time, you know, sanctions were lifted yesterday in a very tight vote in the Senate regarding Mr. Pasta. So the situation is, to say the least, muddled in, in, on, on the American side. Uh, do you see some real opening and some that could change the level of engagement of Western powers, European or American, it's probably very hard now to anticipate, but could possibly be coming, that could support uh, Ukraine beyond um, the declarations that it's a violation of international law, etc. So I don't see a silver bullet uh, for this. I think the answer is the response should be exactly as we have been saying from day one. We should have consolidated international pressure, more sanctions, uh, the economic price for Russia should be higher, and uh, our, our defense capabilities should be increased. Again, it's not, it's not going to happen over one day or over one night. We understand that, we are prepared for that. Uh, at the same time, it's absolutely clear how this is going to end. It's going to end with restoration of Ukrainian sovereignty over Crimea and over the occupied parts of uh, Donbass. And in that sense, we are very satisfied with very clear position of Canada and, and the Americans as well. In the case of Canada, I think it's, it's very clear where Canada stands on this. Again, it's across the aisle, and uh, this will bring fruits. But in terms of specific steps, more pressure, and I think we should go step by step, farther and farther, uh, and with the, with the goal uh, inside. I have a number of questions on the religious aspect, and obviously in the larger Q&A we can come back to I think, I think let's go ahead. I'm well prepared that we can jump from one topic to, to, to another. But in a sense, they are related, right? Because yes. these are different dimensions of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Of course. Of course. Of course. And we haven't even talked about Donbass yet. It's all connected. So my first question is, um, In a sense, we, you know, you, you see the video and excitement and so forth in a sinister way, but you see the emotions. It's with the Thomas. No, with, with Kirch. Oh, it's this. Okay. But then you I'm read. To understand where we are. Well, well, actually, that's my segue. Then you you listen to, you read the reactions, particularly at the highest level of the Russian Orthodox Church, and it's highly emotional. You could see that it. it it hits a chord that is very, very, very deep. Um, now, why do you think it is so emotional? Because the simple proposition, um, and it's easy for me to say, I'm not orthodox, I'm looking at it from you know, a scholarly standpoint, and I've talked to some of my senior colleagues who have, you know, are experts on the, on the church, and basically, you look at the history of the Orthodox Church in other countries, and uh, you could say, well, one state, one church. Every time you get a new state, you get an autocephalous church, more or less. But it's up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. You look at Serbia, you look at Bulgaria, and, and, and the list goes on. And this idea that um, you've got a state, then you have a church. So Ukraine, in that sense, of course, comes much later, but the Ukrainian state is only 25 years old, or 27 now. Right? So this simple proposition that the Ukrainian state being independent should have its autocephalous Ukrainian uh, Orthodox Church 
uh, creates that kind of emotional explosion in uh, in Russia. Well, I see at least two clear reasons for this overreaction on the uh, Moscow side. One is ideological, and the other one is very practical. Ideologically, obviously, the idea of, of an independent Ukrainian Orthodox Church destroys or heavily undermines the concept of the Russian world. Exactly, precisely. Now, going to the practical side, uh, let's talk numbers. When the Soviet Union collapsed, and at that time there was just one church uh, ruled from Moscow, the church had 15,000, I will need your help with translation, parafia, I could have put Parishes. The Russian Orthodox Church in 1991 had 15,000 parishes. 8,000 of the 15,000 were located in Ukraine. More than 50%. And there is a long explanation why that was the case. That was because Ukraine had always been a very religious land. That was also because of the, uh, because the Greek Catholic Church was uh, illegal, was prohibited in the Western Ukraine. So that brought some Ukrainians into the Orthodox Church. After the war. After the, After the war, war, yes. War so there is, there is a whole story behind it. But again, going to the numbers, so in very practical sense, losing, losing the Ukrainian Church was something that Moscow and the Moscow Patriarchate, Patriarchate could not, could not uh, afford. That has not much changed. I think in terms of the number, the proportion that Ukraine, that, that, the, uh, the, the, that the Orthodox parishes in Ukraine were inside of the Russian, Russian church was much higher than the, the proportion of the population. So that damages them, that damages their very practical interests. And obviously, for ideological reasons, it's something that, uh, that was and is a nightmare to Putin and to all the other uh, folks who try to move forward this concept of, of the Ustimir. But I would go further if I'll, I'll ask you if you agree with my analysis here. Um, you know, when the conflict began in 2013-14 and, and, and the war in Donbass, Putin came up with this Novorossiya, essentially saying half of Ukraine speaks Russian and therefore should not be with Ukraine, should be with Russia. And we know what happened. Well, this beyond Donbass, I mean, Novorossiya just collapsed, even though uh, the Ukrainians are Russian-speaking, and the Russian-speaking Ukrainians went to fight, actually, for, for Ukraine. So the whole issue of one language, one nation, you speak Russian, therefore you're loyal to Russia, didn't work. But in this perspective, this was Eastern Ukraine. This was like Russian Ukraine that Russia was claiming back. But with the church, when you actually look at where these parishes are, the vast majority of the Russian Orthodox Church to this day are in Central and Western Ukraine outside of Galicia. It's going to be, it's and inside Galicia, Galicia too. To some extent, but a small extent. Uh, but uh, Volinia, definitely Zakrapatia, Chernivtsi, Bukovina, yes. and, and Central Ukraine. So here you have basically the Russian Orthodox Church. We're talking. I don't have the specific numbers in mind, it could be as high as 70% of their parishes in Ukraine. In these territories that are massively for Europe, for Maidan, and increasing or for NATO, for the European Union, and against Russia. So that kind of, you could say, politically inhospitable territories for any kind of Russian Ruski Mir ideology, because you're not talking about reclaiming the church in the east and in the south. Of course, they're there as well, but the, the, the intensity is much lower for reason having to do with Soviet history, etc. I think it, it wasn't a lost cause for the Moscow church in the beginning. If we play numbers, if they, if they let their priests, their uh, bishops, to go to the unifying Sobor, they would have been a majority there. Uh, but I think Again, Putin made a lot of miscalculations. He has, he has done a lot of miscalculations in the last five years, and this is one of them. They thought that while that challenging Constantinople on this issue, they would be able to keep the Ukrainian church, and they badly uh, miscalculated the situation. And uh, I think uh, that's, uh, 
that's a, that's a very clear mistake. It's not the first one. Attacking Ukraine and uh, occupying our land, they, uh, uh, they pretty much helped many Ukrainians to make, to make up their mind on this East-West choice. And that explains you know, this huge shift in numbers of supporters for NATO and for the European Union. So that's another mistake which, uh, actually, uh, which actually will cost Putin uh, a lot in the long run. And, and I want to ask now about the external factor. Of course, it's not, it's not primarily now a Ukrainian initiative, because autocephaly goes back to the 1920s and the 1940s, and you could say the 1990s with the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, right. Kiev Patriarchate. What's new, of course, is that for the first time, the, the claim to autocephaly now is being, well, officially since January 6, right? Um, being recognized by the um, by Constantinople in a theological sense, of course, but in an urban sense. Um, I just put this timeline to support what you were saying. January 6, yeah. But, but. So my question is, what is your understanding of why, what has led, what has driven Constantinople in the last couple of years, really, to really shift their um, position? I know in their official statement, there is a link with the current Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Somehow, uh, it, it, has, it seems to have played a factor. But there is also, and here I, I don't have an answer, so since you, uh, you're the ambassador here in Canada and uh, very well networked with the community, there's an interesting link in this whole process emanating from Constantinople that led eventually to the Tomos. Uh, that's just last week, right, January 6th. Um, with the, the diaspora, and specifically very uh, high prelates, um, bishops in uh, Edmonton, Hilarion, I believe, yes. and Daniel in the United yes. States, who are originally both from Galicia and immigrated and then went, you know, got promoted all the way to the, the top of these uh, diaspora uh, church organizations and played a major role First in Constantinople, they were both educated either in Constantinople or in an institution kind of patronized by Constantinople, and then played a major broking a brokerage role in um, in Ukraine because they were officially named the envoys of uh, Constantinople to Kiev. So that's an interesting. It sounds all, yeah. almost like CIA conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> I would call it a conspiracy, but it is an interesting uh, networking here, like a loop back from the diaspora all the way back to, to Kiev, uh, which apparently uh, didn't, was not minor. It was in terms of eventually turning the position of Constantinople around for this historic decision. I actually think it was this twist of destiny when uh, uh, Bishop Hilarion travels from Edmonton to Kiev to help us unite the Orthodox Church, I think it's fascinating. Because we have been talking about this 65 million strong Ukrainian family. And I think in the last 25 years, we have traveled far in understanding that it's, it's actually one interconnected community. And then to see how representatives of this community from different countries and from different continents actually work together on, on such an important issue, I think it's, it's fascinating. And I think that explains huge enthusiasm behind this idea not just in Ukraine, but across the Ukrainian community globally. Um, we have several dates here, and I'd like to thank Nadia for putting some dates and numbers, which might uh, help us to understand what, what's happening. And I think there are a couple of things to, to, uh, to understand about the situation. First, as you doing, doing said, the idea is extremely popular, and I cannot find proper words to explain this, to, to describe this huge wave of enthusiasm across the across Ukraine and across the Ukrainian community about this this idea, not just within the Orthodox community. I think it's much much broader. Second, there are some numbers and attitudes. And uh, speaking of this number, I would say, and growing up, I think now when we see that the president has actually started kind of like a roadshow with the Thomas traveling from one region to another, we see that, that, that this enthusiasm is really huge around the country. On the legal side of the issue, it's important to understand that if you live in a small village and if there is a church 
which belongs to the Moscow uh, uh, to the Moscow Patriarchate or to, 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 to any other denomination. According to the Ukrainian legislature, it's the local community which decides which church uh, their parish should uh, should belong to. So You're referring to the law that was passed today at the, in the Rada? No, no, no. Even before this. Okay. So legally, legally, churches in Ukraine do not own the buildings and they do not own the land. So it's very different from from the way it operates here or in many other countries. So when when the law was uh, was uh, passed for this, it was early in the, in the early years of the independence. The idea was that actually we should protect the right of the community because there was not much. Well. Partially it was a response to the reality, because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were not too many world buildings, and uh, there was not much choice. So actually, I think legislators, legislators wanted to make sure that it's the community which will decide what to do with their building or with their church. So that law is still valid, which means that uh, no matter what church generals decide, it, it will be more to to soldiers on the ground uh, in terms of uh, in terms of their choice. So now we see that some soldier, you mean parishioners? Yes. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Soldiers maybe, of the faith. You mean. Maybe yeah. it's not. Okay. It's not. The, it's not the, the best. best. It's not the best. <laughs> so, so I'll take that back. But, but so uh, what I'm trying to say is that by now we have seen uh, seen about 100 parishes which uh, chose to uh, to switch from from the Moscow Patriarchate. To the uh, to the new United Ukrainian Church, out of 12,000 or whatever, it's a very small number. But I think there is a clear way and clear dynamics. So I think there will be a natural process of people uh, moving from one church to another. It's not because there is political pressure on them; it's just a reflection of the reality on the ground. If you live somewhere in in in, in Vinnytsia or in in Khmelnytsky, and you understand everything about the war, about Russia, and about Putin. When the people, when, when a kid which grew up next door comes back from the front line dead, and the local priest does not want to do service for some reasons, because Moscow is not happy with him doing so, that really changes the dynamics on the ground. So I think we will see the slow process of, of uh, uh, parishes moving from the Moscow Patriarchate to the United Church. I don't think it's going to be a landslide. At least there are no signs for that for now. I think there will be more of a national, national process. And I think it's extremely important for the state, for Ukraine, to make sure that, ever, that actually those parishes and those, those people who want to, uh, to, to, to stick with the Moscow Patriarchate, they will have the legal right to, to do so. I think it's very important. And I think we are, we are a mature enough democracy for securing, for securing that. So from a property rights uh, standpoint, these churches belong to the state or in our leased communities? So formally it means that yeah. parish comes together, they have, yeah. a, they have a meeting, yeah. and if, if they make a decision, they collect signatures. And the law says two-thirds, I think, a lot today that was voted. Then, then that's, yeah. that's what they do. And if they decide to change their mind, mind again, they can do it in the future as well. Uh, the, we, we had this discussion, maybe we should allow churches to own, to own buildings, and I think there is a lot of appetite for that. But for many reasons, the law has not been changed yet. We might see some changes in, in the future. So my point is that in the end of the day, it's going to be completely up to the people on the ground to make, to make their decisions. And uh, for the state, it's very important to make sure that, that it stays that way, that no one interferes and no one puts pressure, pressure on the people. A couple of other things. Um, obviously, it would be very interesting to watch the dynamics between the the two men. And uh, Moscow has chosen to challenge Constantinople, and uh, I think it's not clear which way it's going to turn uh, and what is what is going to mean for Moscow. And another point, I think it's, it's also creates a new ground for a very interesting dialogue between the Orthodox Church and the Greek Catholic Church. That's a quote from uh, Svetoslav. <clears throat> Every effort must be made to restore the original unity of the Church of Kiev in its Orthodox and Catholic branches. So I think there is a lot of conversations about this, and I think there are many people in Ukraine who would like this to, to this, this to happen. And so this actually provides a very new narrative for this 
East-West uh, Christianity dialogue. So who knows, maybe Kyiv will play a very historical role in reestablishing this very good constructive dialogue between, uh, between the Eastern Christian tradition and, uh, and uh, Rome. Well, on that hopeful note, we will take questions on any topics germane to uh, Ukrainian politics. Who wants to? Yes. I have a question going back to the Are there any ships of Western powers that are entering into the sea? And by extension, would one possible solution, although it would carry obviously a risk, is that some of the goods to be exported from Mariupol be carried by some of those Western ships? So it's something like like West Berlin uh, tactics, uh, land bridge, or in this case, like sea bridge or something like that. We have not gone that far in our conversations. Uh, we actually we would like our Western friends to be much more active in that direction and uh, more creative about this. But I would say our priority is to restore the free passage through the strait. Are there any Western ships that are entering through the strait? There are some commercial ships which, which go. Uh, what Russians used to do, if, if, if a ship traveled to a Russian port, let's say, uh, what do we have, Taganrog, something like that, they would smoothly let them go through the passage. And if it's for a Ukrainian port or from a Ukrainian port, they, then they would do all the inspections and uh, all the hostilities. And if, you know, if, if you're in this business, and if it takes you not half an hour but several days to go through this trade, that makes a huge difference. And money-wise, that makes you so much less competitive. So that damages uh, international commercial activities. All right. Another question? Your Excellency. If it's the position of the Ukrainian government that these sailors are prisoners of war, in effect what you're suggesting or arguing that there has been a de facto declaration of war by Russia against Ukraine. Now because we know that there cannot be a unified NATO response to this, given the fact that these are, as you're going to argue, prisoners of war, one alternative is to suggest in order to encourage more Western, a more robust Western response, is that there may be a humanitarian crisis being created in this part of the world. Now, you know, I, those of you who know me know that I had to drag Kosovo into this. This is the 20th anniversary of the NATO intervention in Kosovo based on the principle of humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to protect doctrine. Do you think that the Ukrainian government can create an argument on the basis of humanitarian intervention to encourage a more robust intervention on the part of Western countries? Well, a lot of legal efforts, many legal efforts have been made and uh, much more to come. Uh, but I think in the end of the day, it comes not to legal arguments, but to political will. And uh, we would like to see much more of that uh, among our friends in the West. And uh, when it comes to the sailors, um, the chief lawyer which works with our sailors have, has found the Russian statue of uh, border, border service. service which actually provides definitions of what, uh, what the war and the minor military conflict means. And according to the Russian legal definitions, what happened was a military conflict, an act of war, and because there were clear military orders, and which means, even according to the Russian rules, that it's a military action, it's a, it's a military conflict, also it's a minor military, military conflict. So even according to the, inter in, to the internal domestic legislation of Russia, the uh, sailors should be treated as prisoners of war. And that's what's, what our legal position on the case is, and will be. Yes, in the back. Oh, hi, uh, thanks. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, so the question again is about the role of international in this case. Um, so, whatever intervention or influence has been so far, it led to certain wellness, uh, still, I would say. 
uh, on one hand, uh, Russia, Putin insists on their right or their, their power <coughs> to, to do whatever they want in certain region, region of Ukraine, and this violent disregard for international laws of the government. On the other hand, they don't go further. They stop at certain point and become go further. Can you speak up a little bit? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> so there is a certain balance that's formed both by efforts of Ukrainian people and foreign powers who intervened and did something in this case, which led to certain balance whereby um, on one hand, uh, Russia still shows certain willfulness, disregard to any international norms of laws. And on the other hand, uh, they stop at certain line. They don't go further, they don't cross the line. Maybe because they understand the cost, maybe there are considerations. Uh, others, but... but what is they, the question? We need a question. Uh, here's the question, though. Yeah. Um, do you think that there are ways in which international community can push, press Russia past that line to start giving land and retreating, perhaps some certain settlement, some somewhere settlement? And would it even be desirable to, if, if such a ways existed, to do it at this time? Or this balance is good enough for now and let nature take its course until Russia itself decides it. So way out of the stalemate. From a historical point of view, we understand what, what is happening. And uh, I think in one of my first months here in Ottawa, Dominic invited me for a presentation and we were talking about this. There were six empires in the European continent and five of, five of them are gone. And now we are, we are witnessing a very uh, a very dangerous attempt to restore one of the six empires. From, from the historical point of view, it's a suicidal attempt which will not, which cannot be successful. Sooner or later, the Russians will have to pull, to pull back. Uh, the same happened with uh, Afghanistan, the same happened with Poland 100 years ago, the same happened with Finland. So from the historical point of view, again, I am absolutely sure that this is what we are going to witness. They will have to pull, to pull back. But for now, it means we need to put more pressure. We need to make sure that the price is higher. And uh, I guess in the case of Ukraine and Ukrainians, we need, we need patience. Because we understand that it's us who have to fight for, for our land. And it's us who will have to pay the highest price for, the price for this. All right. Yes? Question to Mariupol. Is the Ukrainian armed forces are they building up along the coastline of Mariupol? Since we already know that the Serpentists tried in 2014 to take over Mariupol. The, the short answer is yes. <coughs> and we are much stronger in the region than we used to be. And uh, obviously, this situation really uh, motivated us to work three times faster and to, to, to be well prepared for different situations. But again, if you look at the numbers of the Russian presence, it tells you that uh, they are a dominated power, dominating power in the region. They have enough strength on the ground, at the sea and in, in the air to, to, be, uh, to dominate, to dominate, to, to dominate the, the region. But answering your question, yes, we are taking this very seriously, and uh, it, can, it, it won't be an easy walk for, for Putin if he chooses to advance in any direction further into the Ukrainian territory. Now, on the question of military preparedness, um, after, immediately after this incident, of course, Parliament passed the uh, law declaring, what was the official term in English, a state of emergency? But the martial law. Yes. Martial law, yes. Um, what did Marshall do from the standpoint of preparation? Uh, what's your estimate of the... Well, to some extent, the martial law was used uh, to, to make us better prepared. On the other hand, it was a tricky situation because it was right before the beginning of the presidential election campaign. And the last thing we would like to see happen is, uh, is uh, destruction with the election campaign. That's something which, which no one in Ukraine wants. I think it's very clear to, 
to make sure that we follow all the democratic procedures. So yes, that, that one month of the martial law was used for, for some military preparations, but uh, I think starting from 2014, there are no good and bad days for, for being prepared. Now beyond martial law was lifted, but the ban to uh, Russian males aged 18 to 45 was maintained. Is it likely to be a permanent ban? Because uh, we are co-running co a summer school in Ukraine and we have some Russian students of uh, male persuasion, which right now would not be able to enter the territory. Uh, I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's a pretty... That's a pretty radical move to, uh, to... My question is, is it likely to be permanent? No, it's hard to say. And they won't try to, 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 to predict. Uh, I think there is a strong support to, on both sides of this argument. So we'll see. I, I would wait for a, couple, for a couple of months to understand the broader picture of this. All right. More questions? Yes, right in front. Yes, uh, Irina. Um, I was looking at your list of what needs to be done and I was surprised not to see um, any kind of engagement um, you know, in terms of a peace agreement with Russia. Uh, I think most of us know that, that Minsk, the Minsk II agreement, the second Minsk agreement, are pretty much dead. Uh, Ukrainian media reported that uh, none of the provisions were 100% uh, uh, implemented. So is there any um, intention uh, on the part of Ukraine to engage in some conversations? Um, those are all really great needs to be done uh, points, but I don't know how realistic they are at this point. Um, I understand that you pressure sanctions, sanctions, but I also don't know how effective they are based on we have imposed a lot of sanctions after Crimea and we didn't stop Russia from doing what they are doing now. So, um, is there any discussion on opening conversations? First, on the Minsk process, and uh, uh, I'm afraid to say something not diplomatic enough on this. But, uh, this is a joke, which is a bad joke about this, but uh, I'll still use it. Uh, some people say that Minsk process is like is like Lenin in uh, in the mausoleum in uh, in <laughs> Moscow which means dead but not buried yet. <laughs> so that's one school of thought, which says that uh, you cannot do anything with, with the Minsk agreement. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we are not happy with the Minsk conversation and with the Minsk agreement as well. Starting from the very beginning, uh, it never covered Crimea to begin with. At the same time, it's a very important and very powerful tool, and also that helped us to get our international partners together and uh, work with us. So, having said all the pessimistic things about Minsk, I would not, uh, I would not dare to say that we cannot use it uh, uh, as, a, as a communication ground, as a tool to, to advance. We should. But I, am absolutely, I absolutely agree that we should be more creative about some, about some uh, other uh, possible ways to, to communicate. But the so-called Normandy format with yes. the foreign ministers of four countries, yes. including Russia and Ukraine, right. these talks go on periodically. No? From time to time, From time to more time. or less successful. Not much success with the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. Yeah, of course. All right, there was a question also? Yeah, yeah uh, yes. Uh, Nick Kravitz from Winnipeg, who started the petition about visa-free regime, asked me to ask you what is the status of visa-free regime for Ukraine to Canada? No good news on that. In fact, we even witnessed a very slight uh, increase in the refusal rate for the uh, rate for Ukrainian citizens, which is very disappoint, uh, disappointing to us. At the same time, we understand that Canada is very serious about Im about its immigration rules. So we understand that it's a long conversation with Canada, but I am absolutely sure that sooner or later we will uh, we will get visa free uh, regime for Ukrainians who want to travel to Canada. As of the moment, we have limited success. Uh, first, Canada now uh, issues visas for Ukrainians for the whole length of uh, foreign passport, which is up to 10 years. And also, the procedures for Ukrainians are quite quick. 
normally it's about five days, which is, uh, which is really a good number for Canadian visas. But again, when we speak about visa refusal rate, 26%, I think it's, it's something which is not adequate uh, for the kind of relations which we have between our two, two countries. We need to change that. Yes? Visiting professor here at the uh, Faculty of Law, uh, uh, coming from Belgium, and I was wondering what are your expectations vis-a-vis -vis the regional organizations uh, in Europe, and I mean both the European Union, the Council of Europe, of which both Russia and Europe are part, and the OSCE. Uh, is there anything they should do or we should do better to help you? We benefit a lot from uh, cooperation with our close neighbors in our region. Uh, the Visegrad countries, uh, also Moldova, Georgia, I think it's very important for us to, to cooperate in the future. Uh, with the Council of Europe, I think the Council of Europe has been playing a tremendous role actually in sending the right signals on this issue and uh, I hope that will not change. I think the position is very clear and it's very important that uh, the Council of Europe has not given in to the uh, very strong pressure from, uh, from Russia. And with OSCE, I think OSCE can do so much more on this issue as well. Uh, I was very pleased to hear some good news from Warsaw on the activities and plans of, uh, of the ODIR. Uh, so I think... Could, could you explain what ODIR is? It's the Office for Democratic Institutions and uh, Human Rights, okay. uh, which acts on behalf of the, of the OSC. Okay. So to give you a general uh, answer, I think that the international institutions can do so much more about this. And by the way, it's one of the things which Ukraine and Canada have in common. Because both Canada and Ukraine, we strongly believe in, in the power of international institutions. And uh, today, uh, when free trade international institutions are not sexy words anymore, I think we should really cherish and treasure this kind of common, common values that we have. Could you be a little more specific when you say in particular that the OSCE could do much more? Of course, the OSCE has had and continues to have an observation mission in the war zone, in Donbass. Uh, what, what are the specific demands on the Ukrainian side in terms of uh, enhance and enhance uh, role by the OSCE specifically regarding the conflict? I can give one example I just heard from the Ukrainian Foreign Minister Paolo Klinkin that he knows that uh, OSCE uh, has this conversation about uh, operating a peacekeeping operation in the in the Donbass. So I think it is uh, together with the United Nations. So I think it's just one of the possible directions where OSCE could play an essential uh, role. Peacekeeping, just to name one. Right, more questions? Yes? Question on sort of geopolitics. Uh, we're seeing Russia have disregard for a lot of international laws. We're seeing China have a lot of different dis uh, disregard for the rule of law. Canada is involved very heavily now in discussions in, on that front. Over the last 20 or 30 years, we brought Russia and China, I think, into the World Trade, uh, the World Trade Organization. We brought them in to a lot of our Western um, organizations, probably based on the fact that they're going to follow the rules. Now that they're, they're blatantly not following these rules, is there anything more stronger that the, the Western countries can do with respect to these organizations? Russia is also, for example, Olympics, uh, sports, uh, just total disregard of the rules. So, um, it seems to me that a lot of the international bodies are very hesitant to put any strong punishment on uh, the blatant uh, uh, issue here. Is there any way of uh, trying to put a stronger discussion forward on these levels? Well, I think we would need more brainstorming time uh, on this kind of uh, ideas, but there is one idea which is in the air. It's, it's the reform of the Security Council in the United Nations. And I think there is a lot of dissatisfaction with the way the Security Council operates. Right. 
and it's not just on our behalf, but I think there are many players which are not happy with, with this. I think also that this satisfaction with the UN that we can observe in, in Washington DC can also be used for a serious, profound conversation on how we can change the United Nations to make it, uh, to make it more efficient. Uh, I have a question about the past. Uh, as uh, in the spring of uh, 2018, it was known that the anti-terrorist operation came to an end and the Joint Forces operation was launched. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit what exactly uh, that change uh, means for Ukraine, for the Ukrainian government, and for Ukrainian troops, how that changes the dynamics of uh, what's, going, uh, what's happening in well, first, uh, we have someone in the room who could later talk more about this. Uh, and uh, those of you who have not met yet, I would like to, you to, uh, to meet Oleg Nazarenko, who is our new arrival. He is our, he, he is our, uh, our army attaché. And he works with, with Viktor Sirmak, our defense attaché, that many of you, of you know. One thing which, which I hear from, uh, from military people in Ukraine, this made the chain of command much more functional and much more clear. Because when it, they were operating under this uh, loose format of anti-terrorist operation, there was an issue, good cooperation between different agencies was always uh, an issue. Now there is a very clear chain of command which makes it much more efficient, much more functional. And also there are some legal details which are important in terms of orders and following the orders and things of that kind. So I, I get very good positive response, feedback on, on, on this change. The ATO was formerly led by the SBU, no? according to Correct. law, and now the new uh, situation, I uh, can't even remember how it's called, but uh, is formally led by the Ministry of Defense. Absolutely. Right? Which is your chain of command uh, argument. And when I say different agencies, we should realize that also we have National Guard, uh, which, which has a specific field of operations and we, uh, we also have uh, our border troops which, uh, which is a different, different agency so, and others. So in the case of Ukraine it was very important to make sure that the chain of command is very clear and all the orders traveled back and forth uh, in, uh, in a very transparent and clear manner. Yeah, um, unfortunately uh, there's an elephant in the room that we've all been ignoring, although you alluded to the elephant. His name is Donald Trump. <laughs> he seems to have a love affair with Vladimir Putin and will do nothing, basically, to help Ukraine. And unfortunately, Ukraine will have to wait until the Americans have a new president uh, who understands the world and has an interest in Ukraine, uh, who might then take a, a role in helping the Ukraine, because there's only one power in the world that can challenge this, Russia. I was about to say the Soviet Union. <laughs> and it's the Americans. And right now, you have no chance, unfortunately. I think there is, it, it's obviously a very common school of thought. But on the other hand, we're not in a position to wait and, and give up. I think we should be creative and we should we should, we should try to find different international uh, formats for, for this conversation. And in the case of Washington DC, I, I think we have built quite, surprisingly I would say, we have built quite, quite efficient cooperation with Washington DC in these turbulent times. And that, most, that is mostly thanks to very strong, uh, strong cross-party cross, cross support uh, in, in the Congress. And also, I think it's, it's because of other strong institutions in, in Washington, in Washington DC. But to support what you say, of course, we are following very closely what's happening in Washington, D.C. Of course, it's extremely important to us, just like to all the Canadians. Yes. And, uh, and uh, we hope that all the turbulence and all the political difficulties which our friends in Washington, D.C. experience, they, uh, they will not diminish the American influence uh, on the global scene. For the same reason, we, uh, we are very concerned with the trade war between the U.S. and Canada. And when I was asked about that, I said, of course we are concerned. First, because it's, it's to our friends, and we want them not to be occupied with the trade war, but we want them to, to work together on, much, on, on issues of bigger uh, importance for us and for the whole, 
world. And besides that, we believe in free trade. That's why we watch very close to the negotiation process. More questions? Yes, I have a question. The delegation from Kenya, bringing back the minutes too, um, initially there was uh, certain people on the Ukrainian side that were saying conflict or conf uh, set up a mixed message. Are they still there, the people present on the Minsk to delegation from Ukraine? Not at all. talk about Medvedchuk and uh, that, that, that game. Medvedchuk is used for, for negotiations on one topic of crucial importance. It's, uh, uh, it's prisoners, of war. prisoners of war. So that's his role. And obviously, many people in Ukraine are not happy to see him as part of this process. Uh, it wasn't us who chose him. It was, uh, it was Putin who chose to, to do communications through him. And when it comes to the lives of our people, of our men and women, we are trying to, to, to do everything that we can. Is but again, when it comes to the Minsk process, to the negotiation process uh, itself, uh, I think the message is very clear, the position is very clear, and I don't see any conflicting messages from the Ukrainian delegation. I think it's very, very okay, concerning. So he was involved somehow in the background. On this, on this specific issue. Now, is it specifically in Donbass, or does that include the prisoners of war in Russia? Both. 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 So he's kind of the, the in-between guy, between the Russian government and the... It's not the only channel of communication, but it's, it's the channel which Putin uh, likes the most. I see. Question here? Yes. I had a question. You mentioned the uh, UN peacekeepers uh, for a brief moment. Just specifically focusing on the UN peacekeepers, what is the uh, current uh, uh, standing with the Ukrainian government on the UN peacekeepers? Is it on the priority list? Is it number one, number three? Uh, in terms of Eastern Ukraine, what, what sort of talks are there at the United Nations now? Um, Ukraine and other countries, and particularly when I ask about uh, Canada and Canada's support uh, for the UN peacekeepers, is there any support? Is there conversations with Canada that you're having in creating a, a UN peacekeeper? No much, no, no much progress on this. It is a high priority for us. We believe that it's, it's a very natural way to de-escalate the situation. And there are clear red lines for us. Uh, I can remind that, first of all, we believe that the peacekeeping operation should be for the whole uh, occupied territory, not just for the contact line. That does not make any, any sense. Uh, that also should include the, uh, uh, the re-establishing of control over the border between and Russia. So I think international monitoring uh, over the border is, is crucial, crucial for, for that. Uh, second, uh, Russia should not be part of this peacekeeping operation, just like Ukraine will be. That wouldn't make uh, much sense in this, in this present uh, situation. Um, Canada is supportive. Canada supports the concept. Again, we see that support on both sides of the aisle. Both Minister Freeland and uh, the opposition leader Andrew Scheer made very clear statements, statements on, on this. And we hope that once the international situation changes, we'll see that happen. I'll ask questions about the question about the forthcoming election. Sure. I understand that even though you yourself <coughs> were a deputy, um, as an ambassador you can of course, not comment in a partisan fashion, so that won't be my question about who should win or things like that, but more about kind of the... Thank you. <laughs> you represent the state, not, not the government, right? The state of Ukraine, right? Uh, now, my question is more on the reconfiguration of the political landscape, the electoral landscape. So, we've got uh, veteran players, of course, the president, political formation, Poroshenko, but also Timoshenko, who seems to have, I don't know how many lives, but she's at life number five, <laughs> and back in the leading position. But then there is a wild card, the kind of wild card that's been appearing in most Western countries uh, of late, uh, a non-politician who actually played a politician on TV, in a popular TV show, and uh, announced his candidacy in May, may be flaming out or may not, but is actually uh, in the early polls a player. So that this, 
a phenomenon of populism. So we're referring to Zelensky, of course, who is actually second now in this last poll. And we have a situation where a formation that are trying to recreate a bit organizationally the, what the party of regions used to be, the Eastern electorate seems to be divided, actually. There seems to be an in inability by these uh, Eastern politicians to coalesce again and form a block, at least a regional block. Because Mr. Boyko was actually kicked out of his block, the opposition block, and I believe now is uh, with a, a different formation. So, so you've got a situation where the party of regions, before that the Communist Party of Ukraine, kind of rule electorally over the Eastern regions, and now since Maidan, of course, some territories are kind of outside of the control of the Ukrainian state, we understand that, so it, it has electoral consequences, but um, there is fragmentation of the, let's call it the Eastern vote, and now we've got the wild card of uh, the populist votes that seems to be in sync with what's happening in many countries in Eastern, uh, not Eastern, but Western, Central Europe, United States. After all, the president of the United States is a, is a non-politician. Uh, so that's my question to you in terms of how you uh, envisage the reformation of uh, the political landscape. So first, first there is a disclaimer about this, the, the numbers. Uh, I took them from the massive poll uh, which was conducted by the, the so-called rating group uh, Ukraine. It was done in December and they conducted 40,000 interviews, which is a big number for Ukraine. Normally, if it's about, if it's about 10,000, that's a very, very good picture. 40,000 is, is, is a lot. And that reflects the percentage of those who, who are going to vote and who have made their decision. So that does not include 25% of the voters who have not made their decision. And we should understand that in Ukraine we have two rounds of the presidential election, which means that many people will have to make their decision twice. First time for the first round, and second time when they come to the polls, and they will not see their candidates, and they will have to choose between less likely people. So, um, uh, first about Zelensky. Zelensky is, uh, is the biggest surprise of the campaign so far. And those of you who who speak Ukrainian or Russian, you might have seen, uh, seen uh, films with him. An actor, a stand-up comedian, young, smart, witty, and the country knows him as the star of this film, which was called Servant of the People, and it tells the story of a history of a school teacher, history teacher, who with no political experience becomes uh, the president uh, of, of Ukraine. That's so, what he's trying to do, basically. <laughs> Precisely. So, it's actually a TV series. So right? In the TV series, yeah. uh, after he became the president, mm -hmm. he did not change his lifestyle. He lived very plain uh, lifestyle, without fancy cars and fancy offices. He fought corruption, he challenged the oligarchs, and he cared for the common, common people. So that's exactly what is expected of, of a good presidential uh, candidate. <laughs> Obviously, he relies heavily on the anti-establishment vote, very popular among the millennials, actually, uh, including the Russian-speaking millennials, because Zelensky speaks Russian. Well, actually, it's interesting. Uh, Timoshenko is, uh, uh, for Timoshenko, Russian is, is her mother tongue. The same goes for Zelensky, for Poroshenko, for Boyko. I'm not so sure about Grisenko. So that tells us something about the Stanguish picture, picture of, of Ukraine. Now, in the case of Zelensky, with, this young, with the, those young voters, Ukraine has not seen a millennials wave like Canada has or like the Americans have. So we do not know whether it's going to play or not at this, this election. Traditionally, young voters, they are very volatile, which means they show good numbers uh, during polls. But when the, vote, the voting day, day comes, many of them do not make it to the, to the polling stations. So that's why when people are asked who, are, who is the most likely to become the president, the first choice is uh, Timoshenko and the second choice is Poroshenko. So that's why most of the people will say that uh, most likely we will see those two people in this uh, second round, but anything, everything can, uh, can happen. Now going back to your question, Dominique, how it changes the political landscape. There is one thing which is very important in this campaign. 
there is a very broad consensus on a number of issues between the key candidates. First, it's obviously sovereignty and territorial integrity. Even, even Boyko, who is considered by some more loyal to Moscow candidate, I think his position on this issue is, is very, very, very clear. Second, pro-EU and pro-NATO. Uh, Poroshenko, Hrytsenko and Timoshenko. Poroshenko just uh, uh, initiated changes to the Constitution uh, with uh, the idea of EU and NATO integration. Timoshenko proposed a referendum for integration into NATO in 2014. Presenko has a very strong pro-Western record, so there is a very clear choice. With Zelensky, uh, he's kind of like a tabula rasa for many voters in Ukraine. As of the moment, his uh, agenda is a little bit blurred as of the moment. But I think we also know him for his very strong and vocal pro-Ukrainian position after the war started. This man had a very successful actor's career in Russia and very successful show business uh, uh, activities in Russia. He quitted that and which won a lot of respect uh, uh, for him. So on NATO, he, in, in his last interview, Zelensky said, uh, well, I'm not sure because like, they're not, uh, we don't see an open door at NATO. But he said, I think we should get more use out of our strongest allies. And he mentioned two countries, which was Poland and which was Canada. So he said, uh, maybe if other partners are slow on cooperation, we should go ahead and look to our closest friends and think about bilateral uh, defense uh, alliances or defend, defense uh, treaties. And uh, anti-corruption and democracy and human rights. It would be very suicidal for a candidate who wants to be a president to challenge this issue. Maybe less so with NATO, and Boyko would not be happy with, with NATO, but I think if you, if you want to win the second round, you should pretty much stick with, with uh, these issues. And this is very different from the previous election campaigns in Ukraine. And I think it reflects many changes which we see in the Ukrainian society. So that's something, something new. How, how would religion play out uh, electorally? We do not know yet, because historically we, we have never seen religion a major factor at, at the elections. So in this case, we see President Poroshenko who is heavily involved into the church issues right now, heavily involved, meaning that he pays a lot of attention uh, to, he paid a lot of attention to what was happening with, with the Thomas, and now he travels throughout Ukraine presenting Thomas to the Ukrainian public. But I think there is no clear answer whether, how it's going to, to change to affect his, uh, his, his ratings. Uh, in Ukraine, in our election, it's more important to think about the second round, where people vote not for someone but against someone. So I think you have to be very careful to make sure that you do not make too many new enemies on your way to the second round. So it can play different different ways. How about Irina's question about um, kind of a, a peace plan towards Donbass? Could that could that be a, a major defining issue in the election, or nobody wants to wants to touch uh, that? I think we have we have bold, bold numbers for uh, for what people are concerned with. And so the answers are different when you ask people what's the biggest problem for the country and personally for you. I think this explain explains why we have very clear consensus between the candidates on the war and, and our territorial integrity. But also the social issues are going to be extremely high on the agenda of people when they come to the polling stations. All right, we have time for a, a couple of final questions. Anyone wants to ask one more question to the ambassador? If I have a moment, one, another moment on the election. These are a couple of things which we feel are important to know about this upcoming election. It's going to be really competitive, and this is something which makes us different, not just from uh, our neighbors in Russia and Belarus, but also from some from some of our Western neighbors or our other Western friends. No one can really tell you what's going to happen at the presidential election and at the upcoming parliamentary election, which is good. I think it's it's a very good sign for. Are you referring for... to your friends just west of Zakarpatia? <laughs> 
We have a lot of Without friends. Without naming names. <laughs> no, 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 nothing, to, nothing good or bad about this. It's just, I think we, uh, in some, uh, I think in some countries we see more competitive and less competitive politics. And in our case, it's wide open. Absolutely. And if you think about 25% of, of the undecided voters two months before the election, and then again, let's think about all those people who will come to the polling stations in the second round, and they will have to make their cho choice again. This really means that lots of undecided voters and the lots of votes are for, for grabs. Next, uh, I think it's a clearly pro-Western landscape. Uh, victory of a pro-Russian candidate seems to be very unlikely as of the moment. Everything and anything can change. And uh, again, I, I don't think that uh, we will be lucky enough to see Putin just stay in, uh, stay in the side without any attempts to interfere with, with the campaign. Well, everyone has the upcoming parliamentary election in sight. The parliamentary election is scheduled for October 27, and Ukraine is, is transforming from a presidential republic into a parliamentary republic which means that we'll see more and more powers exercised by the parliament and by the cabinet. So many, many politicians during the presidential campaign already make their plans for the parliamentary campaign. And it's going to be extremely interesting to see the new coalition after the upcoming parliamentary uh, election. There are high threats of Russian interference, and we are trying to neutralize those threats. And we cooperate with our Western partners uh, on this. And I think it's, it's an important time to see our democracy safeguards tested. And uh, I personally, I'm very optimistic in that sense about the upcoming election. Uh, normally in Ukraine, a presidential election is like a Hollywood blockbuster, where in the end you see, you see a good guy and a bad guy. And the good guy wins. <laughs> no, most of the time. No. But we know that one of the two, and, and also it depends on the, whom you consider the good guy. <laughs> They're all bad. And if in the end of, of such a shooter, one of the two should kill the other one uh -huh. or send him or her to prison. Of course, you're talking metaphorically, metaphorically. here. Metaphorically. With an election. With, prison, a real with, with prison, not so metaphorically, because yeah. we, we have seen that happening. Yeah, yeah. So this time, I think we're going to see something very different. Again, because there is a wide nationalized consensus on the major course, course of the country. I think the democratic institu institutions are quite mature. We're talking about free press. We are talking about NGOs, which very, which ex with extraordinary network of election observers throughout the country. The Committee of Voters of Ukraine is one of the NGOs which monitor the elections. They used to have 16,000 election observers professionally trained for Ukraine. So we're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of people with very strong experience of uh, monitoring the election campaigns. Local activism is an important factor. People will like to see their votes counted in an honest and uh, fair manner, which is very good. Um, Again, competition between the parties and international presence. We are very thankful to Canada for sending a strong observation mission to the Ukrainian election. And it, it was a very important decision made by Global Affairs Canada. This will help us to get a very good, legitimate result of the election. All right, I'll have a final question of a personal nature. Sure. You're in an unusual situation uh, <laughs> as an ambassador. Of course, my, I want to ask you to, about your political preferences. It's more like biographical. You're, in an unusual situation of having worked closely with the top two, well, I don't know about Zelensky, but the top two Poroshenko and Timoshenko candidates uh, in the forthcoming elections. First, in Pyotr Kanal Poroshenko, and as a deputy in, in the Batkivshina party. And my question is, um, how do you explain, since you actually know uh, Yulia Timoshenko quite well, I would assume, having worked with her so closely, the resilience of the candidacy of Yulia Timoshenko. There was a general sense when she was released uh, you know, February on Maidan that her time had passed and that there was like a new generation. And here we are, she is leading the polls in 2019, nine years after she came that close from becoming president of Ukraine. So this is my final question. How do you explain this quite remarkable resiliency of the of the politician here? No, I'm really on the thin ice. <laughs> I'm not talking about your preferences, more as, as yes, a, yes. you observe her, you know, professionally. Well, yeah. we should understand that in some senses, uh, Yulia Tymoshenko is, 
is the Ukrainian Hillary. She's the most experienced candidate out of all the key competitors, more than 20 years in politics. So she it's a huge experience, which means all the good and the bad sides of that. So yes, there are people who are very committed to her and there are people who hate her. And that's what happens when you stay for long times in politics. Well, she has several very strong advantages in this campaign. The first is, is her party network. Because if you ask anyone who follows the party politics in Ukraine, they will say that the, uh, the strongest party on the national escape is by far Batyushina, because they have more than 20 years of party building. It means when you go to any even small tiny village, you will find someone who has already had an experience of cooperating with, with the party, which is very important. Second, of course, it's, uh, it's some personal qualities. She's, she's a very strong player. She's a charismatic player. She's a very political creature. She, uh, she, uh, she wants to, she knows how to work with, with people. And so that makes her a very strong, strong player. But there are a lot of things which are going to play against her. First, it's a very long record of, uh, uh, long political record, including many mistakes, which all the all politicians do. And she has very strong competitors. Uh, that includes uh, Petro Poroshenko, who has successfully beaten her in 2014. It was a landslide for Poroshenko. I think for Poroshenko, the big question is whether he will he will find new words to this, for, for the same people who gave him a chance in 2015. Many people are disappointed and dissatisfied, and they will probably make their decision in the very last moment before they they cast their ballots. Maybe most of the, of the 25 percent who have not decided yet. It's the people who used to vote for Poroshenko in 2015. So for him, it's a crucial, crucial two months. But, but it's going to be an interesting fight. And uh, I think it's, it's a very good, decent competition. And when I say that, I mean not just the two of them, but I also include Zelensky, uh, Resenko, and Boyd. I think he uh, was, uh, I have very strong views on his political past and uh, on other things. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very healthy situation when we see candidates with, with different agenda running and exercising their right for politics. So again, I think it's going to be an interesting election year, an interesting election cycle, and uh, I think it should take us ahead. Well, thank you so much. On this note. I wanted to share with you. Uh, right here. Uh, I saw it yesterday in the news, and it's from, from a small village of Shirokino, which is next to Mariupol. Actually, it's right at the front line, it's between Mariupol and the Russian border. So, actually, the Russians are maybe a couple of hundred of meters from this very place. And I think it's very symbolic, and it tells you a lot about what we're going through. So we are on the wall, the winter is coming, actually the winter has come. <laughs> we know that it's us who have to stand on this wall. We know that it's going to be, it is very difficult, it's very dangerous. It means we lose people every day. We do not look nice. Uh, quite often we look clumsy, but we raise the flag. And we know that we fight not just for us, but for many people of goodwill, and for many of our neighbors, and for our distant neighbors like Canada uh, as well. And we know that it's a very noble thing to do, it's the right thing to do, and we know that sooner or later we shall overcome. <laughs>